when I first started making money as a freelancer, let's say three, three years ago or something, I was, and if I was trying to broker some sort of deal with a client, I'd just be like, oh God, I hope they give me this project because I really want some money. Mm. Um, and should I, should I, you know, you're afraid, it's like, and you speak to any freelancer, they'll tell you the same thing, but you're afraid to oversell yourself because you fear they're going to walk away. Um, but most of the time, they've already got it in their head already that they want you, you know, and they want you to do something based on, they've, they've usually done their homework. So you can afford to just like compare prices and, and talk to people, do your homework and like request a decent fee. You're listening to the Label Machine series, a podcast to inspire and help indie record labels and artists to build income streams for their music. I'm Nick Sadler, a music entrepreneur that has helped start and run multiple indie record labels. In this series, I'll be speaking with music industry leaders about their experience and the lessons they learn on how they both market and grow their music income. Welcome to the Label Machine series where we discuss with successful industry professionals how artists and labels market and sell music. My name is Nick Sadler and today's guest is singer-songwriter Rob Bravery. Rob has been compared to the sounds of Radiohead and James Blake. He's released numerous albums over the last 10 years after being signed to a major publishing deal. Originally from Bristol, UK, Rob now resides in Melbourne, Australia and his latest album, Agrophobia's Bossa Nova has just been released this month. So, Rob, how are you today? <laughs> I wasn't expecting the real spiel to come out, but that's great. I'm fine, man. I'm fine. I've, uh, I've uh, done my research. <laughs> yeah, you have. I'm, yeah. Uh, though some of those things were true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, um, what, what we, so, you're in Melbourne at the moment. What time is it there? Uh, it's about 7 a.m. Right. So well, I've actually been I've been up since about five because on Friday mornings here, uh, the basically all of Melbourne's bins get collected outside my front door. Uh, well, it seems like that many anyway, and there's a large <laughs> truck. Does it. So it's sort of um, yeah, it's quite disturbing. Uh, but I've become quite used to it, so I've been up for a while. I'm, I'm oh, nice. On my second coffee. Had you? Oh, nice. Had your coffee. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're just going to get into a bit of history. Um, how did you, how did you get started in the um, in the music industry? Like, what was your kind of first, I guess, uh, band or live show? Um, oh man, I think I used to play music with my older brother when I was about fifteen. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a number of rock bands going on, and I used to sort of try and shoehorn my way into those, did loads of gigs with him. I guess that was my first experience, um, and that was in Bristol. Uh, but actually, like, I don't know, I, I moved to Bath at about the age of 20 uh, and started trying to write songs more seriously myself and then take, I don't know, take, take the idea of a music career a bit more seriously at that point. Um, and yeah, and then I uh, kind of started, started playing a lot of that circuit in Bath for a while, then moved to London in about, I think it was about 2006, 2007. And yeah, I guess slowly crept up the, the ladder of, of getting somewhere with it. You know, I actually started playing as a session player for a couple of bands. And that was a good in for meeting people. Uh, so I, I played keyboards for a number of bands around that period. Met who would become my manager um, for my solo career uh, around that time. And yeah, that's kind of when things like, I don't know, things started to happen. But, but I think it's important to state at this point that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily describe myself as a successful solo artist by any stretch. You know, it's like my, my career has been, it's been interesting. There's like lots mm. of different, variations and what I've tried to achieve but I've ne I, if I'm not the kind of I'm obviously not a, su a successful singer-songwriter so I, I'm not gonna yeah, that. I, yeah I think I want to get into that a little bit later on as well because <laughs> you know I I think as well like what does you know people have got different what versions. Constitutes, success yeah, what exactly can, like yeah. I mean if you can if you can be making if you can be making music <laughs> making a career paying your rent doing music which you do yeah. In a lot of people's yeah. eyes, you're a successful artist. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
you know, maybe if, you know, when you've been on tour and you've been rubbing shoulders with what people would like, you know, the, the traditional super successful yeah. people doing top forties. Yeah. And those eyes, maybe, um, maybe it's been a different deal, but, yeah. um, but you know, we are, we are, we are really talking about, um, the independent world as well. And, you know, and I, and I think for me anyway, if, if you can, if you can make a living doing your music, you know, I think that's because yeah. it's incredibly hard even to get to that point. There's a lot of people that don't even make it that far. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. And it's not that I'm not trying to, I wouldn't want to turn the conversation in, in a, a realm of like, okay, this is ridiculous because I'm not successful. It's more yeah. a case of it's, it's better to be clear on what we're talking about. Cause if we, cause me talking about my timeline as a singer songwriter from, you know, the age of 15 and doing what, what you hear, let's say you get Joni Mitchell on the phone and you're like, Hey, so tell us about your early experiences of music. It makes a bit more sense. Whereas with me, it has been, uh, mm. it's a bit more of an interesting, mm. uh, sorry, not more interesting than Joni Mitchell's life. <laughs> it's more interesting actually. Are you comparing yourself um, to Joni Mitchell? Yeah, I would, but hers has not been as interesting as mine. So it's not really comparable. <laughs> So, um, so talking yeah. about not having a successful music career, um, yeah. you then got a major publishing deal. So how did that come about? <laughs> well, yeah, no, no, but this is the thing. It's, I would compare, like, so I've had a number of deals. Mm -hmm. uh, they went from big to slightly smaller. You know, it's like, I don't know, maybe three or four different either record or publishing deals. Yeah. Throughout that, through, I think it was between about 2010 and 2017. Um, and the thing is, the, the deals come about um, and you either capitalize on, on them. And I think, you know, like as a writer, I, I think this is an important distinction to make. I would describe myself as somebody that can write music relatively well. And I've since made a, a career work, you know, in that field. But what I tried to be initially was a writer and a performer and the whole package. And that was confusing. I just assumed that that was going to be something I could achieve. But I got my initial signings with labels based, well, just off the back of being a decent writer. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is you, you, know, you then realize that there's so much you have to deliver as a human being or as an mm -hmm. identity you know, in that realm. Uh, and I being a performing that. artist as well as a writer. Yeah, yeah performing. Not only that, but like going on bloody radio, talking to mm -hmm. people, all these things that didn't come naturally to me. Um, or whatever it might have been, uh, you know, it could. You, they ask you to do all kinds of stuff, basically, mm. when you sign to a label. And suddenly, I was under a lot of pressure to do those things, and I, and I realized I couldn't do it. It took me about five or six years to realize that it wasn't mm. for me. So now, you know, uh, I've, I've managed to, I guess, fall into something that en enables me to use my skills as a writer, but I don't have to do any of that stuff and mm. I can still make a reasonable revenue stream from it. Mm. But it's not something that I would, it's not something I expected to happen or I ever, I never sat down as a kid and thought, well, you, sh I, you should be doing that, you know? Yeah. Did, when, with, the, with going back to the publishing deal though, like how, how much of a difference did it, did it actually make to your career at the time and how much of a difference did it make in hindsight? Um, yeah, I guess like it was good to get some money in particular, you know, at that point I was, I never had any cash while I was making my first album, uh, struggling to survive in London. So yeah, it was good that we got an injection of money. It was also like a moment of validation from, uh, it was EMI music at the time. So it's sort of like, well, that's cool. This is, this is, we, you know, I haven't been wasting my time. That's a good feeling. But in terms of like opening doors, I think with with just publishing because what what i really needed i think was not only a publishing deal but uh, a really good independent label to get behind the product i was doing that would invest in in me and know and try to understand the type of artist i was and then send me into the right areas uh get the right band all that stuff get the right shows the right support slots but unfortunately just a publishing deal at that point wasn't really enough to launch the project I was doing. And I actually got kind of bundled in with uh, their other recent signings at the time, which were kind of major pop stars. Uh, and it didn't really add up. I felt like kind of the sort of uh, illegitimate 
child of, of EMI for like for a period. I, I don't know whether they saw it that way. I think they probably just forgot all about me to, to, to some extent, you know, because I wasn't. The, uh, the gnawing of the tin that they just, that just yeah, didn't they quite did, come through. Yeah. Do, would do you agree? Like, would you agree with that? You know, there is that sort of myth or industry thing that majors, you know, they sign 10 artists expecting nine to go nowhere and one to blossom. And, and like, in your experience, did you find that was the case? I think it's probably like the tail end of that, that version of the business model for the industry. Cause I think that's probably doesn't happen anymore. No one's got mm-hmm. enough money to do that. Uh, but like definitely in the nineties, definitely in the early noughties, there would have been tons of labels still trying to do that. Cause it makes sense, right? You can, and particularly if you're doing like reasonably small signings, one of them's going to bloom if you've got a decent, if you've got a decent headhunter walking around, like walk, watching the gigs and stuff. Mm. Mm. So, this, so something else I, I, uh, I want to talk about though, with, you know, getting, getting noticed as well. And I think this probably happened in your period when, when in that seven years is you uh, decided to do a, as a way of, um, yeah, I guess finding a new audience. Um, you decided to do a Lana Del Rey cover and um, you put that together and that ultimately led to you working with her as well, which which was a bit of a like a, a, a kind of rogue way of going about stuff. Do, can you just talk us through that? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I actually, in that particular case, uh, I quite like the song. So that was one of the big pop stars that I'm referring to that got signed to EMI at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, as in, it was, it was about the exact same time that we signed there. And the guy that signed me plays the track that they were about to release ahead of its release. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. Uh, and I, 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 I like, despite being like a, a pretty alternative writer, I quite like pop music and I've always tried to st- stay abreast of what's going on and I think like I heard that song and thought that's a great example of a pop like an out pop song uh and it, and uh yeah we we just covered it because we liked it as in me and my band we filmed it at home mm-hmm. and um it was in the in the days as well uh because this is about 10 years ago where I think if you post something on YouTube at that point uh and it's tagged reasonably well, then it, it has the potential to just get quite big, um, or you know, get we get recognised, thousand views because it because it's good content. I think these days YouTube is a is slightly more convoluted, or well, not just slightly, but it's it's very difficult. If you were trying to start a new YouTube channel at this point, it's such a known revenue stream that every man and his dog is is doing that exact thing. There's just so much content up there that it would be very unlikely that one clip like that from the off, as in your first post, would actually be successful. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, that, that's how it happened. And yeah, I think they just like, literally, uh, Lana saw the clip, said, do you wanna, do you wanna work together? Do you wanna do something? You know, that was it. But that's, that was, I don't think that would happen necessarily in 2020. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you you were saying you got uh, off the back of the publishing deal, you you got different various indie uh, label deals for your albums. Um, how yeah? How did you find the experience of working with a indie record label um, as a as an independent artist? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The, I mean, the first indie label I worked with. Uh, were really nice. They 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 weren't particularly wealthy. Like they didn't have like a lot of money to invest in it. It was like they liked the record. They wanted to put it out. Um, we did a, a extensive campaign trying to get somewhere with it. Um, I feel that they did everything they could. Really, they they um, you know they probably spent a fair bit of cash by the end of the process. Uh, I liked working with them. I mean, like. I think, I, unfortunately, <laughs> the, the answer to this question is slightly, as much as I'd like to give like a broad, a broad response for somebody that might be listening that is, mm. you know, wants the information or the inside track on that mm. situation. In my case, I was extremely, I was going through a period of my life where I was extremely pedantic and controlling 
Uh, so I basically was like riding people like a moron, expecting everything to, to go my way and not really listening to the way they wanted to promote my music at the time. So unfortunately, I think that that um, that coupled with, uh, as I said earlier, like an inability to deliver personally on, in, in some other areas of what I needed to do as a solo artist, uh, probably led to it being not quite as successful as it would have, I would have hoped. Mm. Um, but yeah, like working with an indie label, I found much more, uh, I don't know, I found it a lot more useful than, than the experience I had with a major publisher. You know, there's no massive amounts of red tape in order to get a conversation with somebody. Um, you know, I could just reach out an email and we could discuss how we want to make things work. Um, so pretty much everything was an option and they were extremely accommodating, um, you know, in terms of taking my ideas on board. So it was cool. Mm. So I guess, you know, so you were, you were saying working with a, with a label, I guess, let them do their thing. So how would that, how would you contrast that with when you self-released an album um, and you thought, you know, I'd, I'd, I'll, I'll do it myself. I'll kind of put all that together. How was that experience in comparison? Um, well, again, man, it's a great question. Uh, might not be 100% applicable to me, uh, just because my version of releasing my own work mm. uh, as a solo artist, and this is, this is the thing I, I probably should stress, is that my work as a solo artist or anything I've done as a solo artist since the period where I had label involvement has been more of a hobby, I'd say, whereas, uh, you know, my work, as in my freelance-based work as a producer and writer is something completely different. So what I've done in terms of releasing things uh, without a label since, it's just, I've literally done no, no work to create a successful release. I would post something and On leave it there, leave it in the, in the ether and just see what happens, you know. And, and I'm quite aware that nothing happens and it, it won't happen because I just don't have the energy to, mm. to invest in that stuff. So I would, I'd say I would imagine posting something on Bandcamp with a reasonable campaign that you create yourself, mm. uh, you know, and following uh, all the, the many things you can potentially do as an independent artist is actually a great idea. But my experience with it, unfortunately, is limited. Mm. You touched on um, up like creating alternative income streams, um, you know, which you've moved into in recent years. So how important would you say these are for an indie artist these days? Um, probably quite important, I would say. Uh, unless, unless. <laughs> so you're either, you're either rich already, right? So you've either got some money or your parents have got some money. Um, and or you saved a ton, or whatever. Trust what was it called a trustafarian? Tr yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you're either one of those, um, or you are a successful independent artist, which is something that is extremely hard to achieve. I'd say uh, there's great there's examples of people that have done it really well, and like and when I actually go onto Bandcamp, for example, and look at how people have um, uh, yeah created a nice little niche a little world for themselves selves on Bandcamp. I'm, I'm just, I'm quite in awe of how that's happened. And I think that's great. Um, it seems like a good community there that people kind of support each other. And even through my me meager experience of putting stuff up there recently, um, you do quickly learn that people, and I, I've actually, I put my stuff up there for free, but you quickly learn that people want to donate money. Uh, and I'm always amazed because I've, you know, you go in there thinking it's, you know, feeling quite skeptical about it, but people want to give you money for your music. Um, so yeah, like, sorry, going back to the question, I'd say, obviously it takes a long time. Like if you're starting from scratch and you want to be an independent artist, you're going to need some, some other form of, of revenue coming in um, until you break, you know, mm -hmm. whatever product you're putting out there and it's a success. Um, so yeah, so do, if you can make it in music, then great. 
whether you're teaching or like um, God knows, or you just want to work any other random job. I don't know, but yeah, so for you, me, I yeah, for me, I um, I think I have sought a music-based job because I just don't really feel at this point in my life I'm able to do anything else effectively, um, and and also like it's yeah, I don't I, I don't really want to do anything else. Mm. Yeah. So I guess for so people that might not know what like you know as a as a music producer, what are other areas in which you can, um, you know, in which you can generate money? Um, you know, what are some of the areas that you might be working in? Um, you know, where it's proving to um, be a bit lucrative. Yeah. Um, well, presumably, if you make music for personal reasons, or you're trying to be a solo artist, you've got usually got some musical equipment at home. Um, I've been accruing musical gear for years and I, I um, uh, you know, am able to produce, produce to a reasonable standard, uh, you know, without paying studio fees. Mm -hmm. um, so that's good. So uh, in terms of like how to make money with that, um, it depends what you're good at really. If you're like, for me, my, I think I'm better writer than I am most of other things. Um, so I personally, uh having like accepted the notion that my solo career as a serious uh songwriter had pretty much you know gone down the pan at some point uh decided to find a way to still write and make money with it um so for me it's i i actually operate under an alias um as an anonymous writer in some very strange uh worlds on the internet that pay money uh, either either to utilize my services as a producer and writer. So, um, for example, recently I've been doing a soundtrack for a, a film, uh, like a kids movie in, in the states. Um, that's something I've been working on. There's there's uh, working for people that have successful YouTube platforms is a good revenue stream. Um, and in, that, in, in which case, for me, I've been writing music for those platforms and then taking a share of the profits made from advertising revenue. So are these, uh, are these YouTube platforms, they're looking for bespoke original, like are they just looking for original music or are they looking for bespoke? Like you, they want you to write it around whatever they're kind of, you know, they're talking about makeup, they want a makeup song or something like how, Yeah, I think like it, 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 with YouTube in particular, it's you can be more successful if you have something completely bespoke because there's it's quite a tight ship in terms of how it's it's run with uh, royalties and legal legal issues so if you in, unless you have a completely bespoke original product as a youtuber to post um you know and just just to be clear i'm not a youtuber but i i i Work. work with people that are. Um, yeah, unless you have a bespoke product to work with, you will have to state, because they have algorithms that detect everything, you have to state clearly what's what's being used. If you've got something original that's extremely popular, I mean, it's, there's, there's, not a, there's not a lot of difference between, so if you have a really successful song that's bespoke to a video that's been made on YouTube, it's just like releasing a single up the charts, you know? And obviously, if, if it's music, you can... Um, Whoever owns that music gets the royalty, so they yeah, are. Yeah, and, and also you get, to send, you get to send a lot of traffic to other streaming platforms. So basically the, the revenue that comes in from a successful YouTube song or clip or whatever, it then translates across to Spotify, uh, iTunes. And really? All the other. So if you, you've then essentially got, if you've got enough of those things out there in the world that are constantly streaming and ticking away, then you reach a situation where at the end of each month you can recoup revenue from not only the, all the YouTube advertising from all the songs, but then you have all the, the revenue from the streaming platforms as well, like Spotify and such. Wow. So what, I, I guess, are you being paid um, like, do you do get like an upfront fee and then share in the revenue of both the masters and the publishing across these platforms? Um, or are you just getting a straight up fee and they own everything hundred percent or is it somewhere in the middle? 
Yeah, it would depend on the on the person you're working with. So the main people I, I started working with, we because we didn't know how things were going to work out, and they didn't know either, uh, we started on a basis that they paid me a fee to do some work and then they'd cut me 50% in the, in the back end. Mm -hmm. um, and as we uh, developed a relationship, you know, we didn't, we didn't need to worry about my upfront fee after a while because it was quite clear that we had a, a winning situational formula that's going to just cover us both. Yeah. Um, but yeah, generally that would probably be useful if, if you're working with somebody that you don't know on YouTube or you don't, because you can never guarantee success with YouTube. And as, as we've said, it's like, it's an extremely saturated platform. So you could, you could create something for a, a YouTuber uh, that they want to use. And then the clip makes absolutely no money for them or you, and you've essentially wasted a lot of effort and time. So yeah, until you've got a, a strong relationship with somebody that you kind of, have an idea of how things are going to go. I would suggest getting an upfront fee. Um, but yeah, um, and you know, other situations for me, like like I said, working with a, on a soundtrack or something like that. That's it's like a a deal in of itself where you would have to negotiate whatever terms you think are right. Um, probably requires a bit of like research into what's normal, you know, for that kind of thing. Um, when you say, so you're talking about, um, doing a, um, soundtrack for a film. Yeah. So, I, I, so is that, you know, I want an upfront fee and a percentage on the back end or something like that. Like, yeah. So that would be, that would be definitely a, a kind of 50, 50 for, Well, in my case, it was 50% upfront, 50 on delivery. And then, and then there's a, a revenue share for all streaming platforms. If the film, you know, if the film's successful the soundtrack's out there you're covered and you get 50 percent of the royalties uh coming in from the streaming of the soundtrack basically um but you know i whether that's whether that's a good amount or or bad i really don't know that's just me as a random guy trying to vote trying to navigate my way as a as a freelancer really it's like anything i don't i don't really know if that's the right way to do it so if you're listening and you uh you're wondering what the exact amount to, <laughs> to request is don't go by what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but i mean it, it sounds like you've done the sensible thing negotiate something up front that covers your time um yeah. so if there is if there is no back end you're still covered and then if that is a success you'll share in the revenue of that success yeah, I think like important important thing to state would be that uh, it's quite tempting to sell yourself short. I think when it comes to because like it's so hard to uh, to forge a career and make money from music, and you get very used to that feeling throughout your life. And unless it's been like a dream all the way, and you just got you know, for me it's been like up and down, and I've reached a point where when I first started making money as a freelancer, let's say three, three years ago or something, I was, and if I was trying to broker some sort of deal with a client, I'd just be like, Oh God, I hope they give me this project because I really want some money. Mm. Um, and should I, should I, you know, you're afraid it's like any speak to any freelancer, they'll tell you the same thing, but you're afraid to oversell yourself because you fear they're going to walk away. Um, but most of the time they've already got it in their head already that they want you, you know, and they want you to do something based on, they've, they've usually done their homework. So you can afford to just like compare prices and, and talk to people, do your homework and like request a decent fee. Cause otherwise you just, you're gonna, you're not gonna be able to survive really. Mm. I mean, the worst they can do though is say that's too much. Can you go lower? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and if they if if they walk away after you've tried to like hit them with a fee, then what on earth? Like, what kind of yeah negotiation is it? You you were you were mentioning doing your research. Like, what would you what 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 would you advise to do as research? Like, where can you find this information? Uh, yeah, for me, man, I think like obviously look, there, there are a number of platforms online. Google something. For me, I've always just spoken to people that I met and know in the industry over the years that would might be able to give me a bit of insight into what's normal um, mm. so 
yeah, if you're lucky enough to have some people around that might have a clue, that's good. Yeah. No, I, th- I think that is, it's, there's one thing at the label machine as well that a lot of the members say that they find the most valuable is just being able to ask a question from somebody who's got experience and they can, and they can just give an answer because it, yeah. it, it's like, it's details, isn't it? You can read about generalizations or watch YouTube videos, but when you need specific numbers of what's actually happening in the industry, the only way you're going to get is speaking to someone who's, who's actually in there. Yeah. Right. Um, so, um, if you just sort of staying on the, um, be, you know, being a, a composer and writer, uh, and sort of tips and, and tricks, I guess, what, if someone did want to start doing music for YouTube or, um, films, what, what advice would you give them to, uh, to find work and, and kind of put themselves out there? Um, ooh. Yeah, I don't know, mate, to be honest. Um, I think this is assuming the person, this is assuming the person is on nodding terms with, <laughs> like, just how to write, like, writing reasonable music. Yeah, I mean, you're saying you, you can write good music. Like, so the person can do all that stuff, like, so we don't have to talk about that. Uh, yeah, you've got all, your, got all your music there, you know, got all your, you've got all your compositions up together. <laughs> <laughs> You got your compositions in a Dropbox, right? Um, then I don't, I don't know. I, I guess um, again, in my circumstances, um, I happen to know a few people that that were able to help out a little bit with that, based on having a pre-existing decade of working in the music industry and you know trying and failing and trying and failing all that stuff. Um, that helps to have a few people to reach out to, a bit like the previous question. But I guess if you didn't know anyone at all, um, there are a number of platforms, I guess, that you can um, post your, your music to. You could perhaps you could reach out to YouTubers personally via the uh, messaging on the site um, yeah. and say, look, I, this is what I do. Uh, I like your channel. I think, you know, whether that works, I really don't know. But perhaps that's a, an in. You can um, release snippets of your music on SoundCloud and Bandcamp and reach out to the community there. That seems quite open. I find both those platforms actually quite useful. Um, and of all the, of all the platforms, there there is still a sense that um, people seek good music and they repost and they aid each other in the, in the progression, you know, um, across which yeah. platforms sound, soundcloud band, and uh, band camp, oh, band camp. Two classics. Yeah. I mean that I've just found that having music on those sites, um, particularly sound, uh, soundcloud have had music on that site for a long time. And I think like, um, there's, uh, yeah, there's a bit more of a, if you, if you attempt to grow a community on that, it will work. I think if your music's good, you can, uh, you know, reach out to people, they might share it and so on and so forth. Yeah. It's a bit like the old MySpace model in theory. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know, man, whether that stuff will, so will pay, just like you've got to be willing to put in a lot of time uh, knocking on people's doors, I guess. Net, net, um, networking essentially and yeah. looking around in your own personal network as well are the yeah. two kind of areas. That's it, yeah. Okay, cool. So I, I wanted to talk about um, a little bit about um, music trends. Um, now, I, I know this is probably, um, I guess, maybe uh, less relevant these days. Um, I mean, are you, uh, well, no, I, I say that, but you've, you've got music that are, that's coming out on YouTube and then it's going across these platforms. Like, what, what have you been, where have you been finding the royalties are coming from um from the major platforms like we're we're you know i guess in ranking like who's bringing in the most between you know spotify itunes amazon title oh man i would love to answer that question with with some more detail than i'm about to <laughs> <laughs> do you just get a royalty check each I month and you're like i man. don't do my own accounting uh, um i sound like mega now don't I? <laughs> like, yes. what does he do <laughs> uh, 
Are you just too successful to uh, do your own accounting? You can see the size of the mansion I live in, so like, I don't think I need to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I just someone does the accounting. I wouldn't know where the street, where the major, w- w- you know, what's bringing the most in in terms of the mm-hmm. platform. But all I know is the, uh, you know, if yeah, so in ter- that's in terms of music on streaming platforms. YouTube, I know roughly what that brings me every month. Streaming platforms, all of them I take as a, as a singular royalty gotcha. amount. You know? gotcha. Yeah, so unfortunately can't. No, that's, uh, that's, that's fine. So the, when it comes to, I mean, I guess when you were doing music, blogs, did you find they were still relevant? Mm. Yeah, place? yeah. So when, I was do, so when I was a solo artist, or, you know, I, with a night with a, a solo entity in the, in the real alternative music world. Uh, yeah. yeah, blogs, blog, there was a, definitely a period where blogs felt relevant. I think there was like a, con- I don't know whether it was just my perception of it at the time, but I think around 2010 to 2015, um, I felt that blogs, blogs and music videos and the combination of those two as a promotional tool felt like a really relevant and powerful way to launch music. Uh, I, I don't know whether, again, it might be my perception, but since that time, I think the blog world is less relevant because everybody knows with the introduction of advertising on all platforms, uh, particularly Facebook, uh, having ch- and has really changed the, uh, the playing field a little bit in the sense that new- news sites, both musical and otherwise, are so geared towards clicks that they will just post anything and therefore the credi- credibility of those sites um, in, the, in the musical blog world and, and elsewhere has gone down the toilet. Um, so I think there was a time between maybe 2010, 2015 when you saw a, a new act on a blog and you thought, oh, that looks interesting. I'll give it a click and see what the video is like. These days, I feel it's a bit different. I think we get the sense that there's just such a saturation of that market and you don't really trust those platforms as much as you used to based on the ads that are being sold, you know, uh, per click. So how do you mean the ads being sold per click for a blog? Yeah, that's, 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 yeah the sentence didn't make perfect sense. But what I mean is obviously the blog is gearing their, their front page or the thing that you get on your feed to make you want to click on it. And uh, when you click on it, uh, you may get fooled into have been uh, have clicked on something that's just completely irrelevant to you or just or just lacking in any real substance and i think um that is something i i, I feel that uh, it, it's made me unfollow and not and not really take those things seriously anymore like i said it's my perception i'm now 37 years old not quite next year but i but i'm old enough to to be feel a bit disenfranchised by that situation uh, if I was younger and, I, and it was still fresh and I was excited by what, say, Pitchfork are putting out there every day, mm. um, then maybe, maybe I would still, still think it's relevant. When you, so that was, you were saying blogs and then going to watching a YouTube video clip. So if we took blogs out of the equation, is putting up a good YouTube music video still hold a lot of weight these days? Hmm. I tell you what, man, that's, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. I think, um, as I said, I, I, I think, uh, there are, exa- there are examples of people still doing that, like a powerful video. I'm trying to think of one recently. Uh, if I, if I try and think of a recent one, I'm going to say something that's really old. <laughs> In years <laughs> people, old. Yeah. Be like, you know, that recent one, what was it? No doubt. Uh, don't speak. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. Just one of those, uh, but no, th- there are examples. If you do something that's like dazzling and huge, uh, okay, uh, WAP, Cardi B, right? Yep. Uh, that's, this is a great example of, I mean, this happens to be the biggest pop star in the world, the biggest like, rap, rapper on the planet, um, dropping a huge track with a, with a massive high budget video. So it's gonna be successful. So it's like, it's hard to really use that as the, you know, as the gauge, but, um, in terms of it being like a powerful use of the platform, it's a good example of it. Um, but yeah, I feel like if you're your average Joe or like 
maybe a small indie band or something trying to put up a, um, a, a music video on YouTube as a way to promote your music, it would hint, in, in order for it to be successful, it would probably hinge on your YouTube channel already having a successful output. Um, otherwise, it, it, it does run the risk of being buried, um, you know, without the, without the necessary promotion. I guess you can use, you can cross, uh, use sorry use different platforms I'm going to say something clever then but you can use different platforms simultaneously um to try and get as, as much promo and traffic sense of that clip as possible i'm sure there are ways if yeah. you've got the right means and the, and the team to do it pay for facebook ads get behind it you know all that stuff they do work and they do reach people it's just like whether you're willing to, to do it um, yeah so I guess with, when you set with YouTube, it's um, it, don't make an amazing video and just work it on YouTube channel, have a long-term game for YouTube, like build up your subscribers on YouTube, just like, I guess you build up your followers on um, Spotify, um, yeah. YouTube and Instagram. It, it's another channel to build up. So when you release something, there's a built-in audience. Yeah, it's all, it all, let's face it. I think, I think the answer to any of these questions like related to, um, utilizing the online platforms is it's really hard to, it's really hard to do I think like uh but there's so much proof that it does work if you're willing to like put in put in the hours like look at those guys um twins the new trend uh you know those guys the guys that just like sit there like young brothers and they just sit there listening to um uh yeah uh, random famous songs of the last like 50 years or something and that's all they do they've got they've set up a brand and they just kept plugging away with it until one of them just hit you know um, and uh, and now everything they post gets you know at least 100,000 hits now, and they do, they, now do they review like new music as well so people are like I want to get my music on this channel because I need to get 100,000 plays Maybe, yeah. Maybe they should. I don't know if they've been doing that, but that's what I'd be looking to do if I was them. Did, they got their merch as well lined up underneath. It's great. So you were saying, yeah, so I, I mean, I guess having, having your merch lined up, setting up all these income streams is what you need to do and have all these long tails is how you can create a career rather than just saying, oh, well, I, just need to get a, I just need to get a record deal and release an album and then I'll, and then I'll be loaded. It's not really the way it's going to work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think I don't even know what the situation is with label investment <clears throat> these days. But I'd imagine if, if I was, a, I'd imagine the labels are far more reluctant to sign anything with anyone these days, unless it's exactly the right look and exactly the right fit. Um, mm. And I think they, I don't, as I said, because I've been out of that world for a little while, I don't really know. But I'd imagine that there is a bit more of a a team element to the label and artists working together. I don't know. You, you probably know more about that. From a, I yeah. I mean, I, I, I definitely, you know, speaking to other label managers, what they're looking for in artists is they're looking to see that there's something already going, that the artist has, has created some momentum themselves. Like, you know, it's not bad. Like people like, Oh, you don't want to self release your music because you know, why does that mean you couldn't get a record deal? It's, that's wrong. Like, if you can put some of your own music out there, you can get some buzz behind it. You can get it on some blogs. You can get it at like over 10,000 streams on Spotify. As, and then you go to a record label saying, hey, I'd like to run an EP with you or something. The label's going to go, oh, wow, you've done all this yourself. Cool, you get it. Like, you're going to be a great member of our team. Like, we're going to tell you to do stuff and you're going to straight away and do it. So, yeah, I think it's, I, I think it's definitely the first step in the music industry now is DIY. And then it's building a team around you if you need to. And part of that team could be a record deal, could be a publishing yeah. deal, could be a manager, could be an agent, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I think the days of, unless you're under, the, I think unless you're under the age of 18 and you can sell your yeah, yeah. youth and then you can possibly get a deal before you've really released anything um, on the merit of your talents and your, and your youth basically. But I yeah. think as soon as you're over the age of 25, you know, it's, it's, it, it's DIY. Yeah. Until, yeah. You know. Exactly. Yeah. You probably, you've had enough time. You've had enough time at that point <laughs> to get DIY shit going. If it's not happening, <laughs> you'd be like, what, what else have you been doing, man? Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask about, and just because you probably got a bit of an idea of like the YouTube royalties. 
are, are there, so if, if you're, and this is, this is more from, a, again, like a, a major record label point of view, but if you're going to invest a hundred grand to make a, a, an amazing music video, but you know that video is going to get a hundred million plays, is, does it, you know, what, what's the revenue generated off a hundred million plays? Is like, is that going to get close to that hundred thousand more or less? Do you know? Oh God, yeah. Um, good question, man. Um, so is the question just straight up? What is the, what is the amount earned on a click? Well, like, so, so you're saying hypothetical of a hundred million plays, how much money is that? in terms of like what you're going to make from ads. Is that, yeah, is I mean, that and assuming you own the rights to the music, you're yeah, saying yeah. You, own, you own the rights yeah, to the music. You own full rights. Um, I'm setting this up as if I've got the answer to it, but I don't actually have the answer to, to that. The nearest, think, to, to, to the today. nearest 100,000? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, are you, are you going to make thousands or, uh, you yeah, know? You, make, you can make a lot of money. You, there's, there's a lot of... Okay, let me think. Um, I'm just trying to do the sums because we've got, in some of the people I work with, we've got, uh, let's say we've got a track that's, I think it's about 30, I don't know, 36 million or something at the moment. Wow. Um, and you're like, I'm just trying to think, but this is 36 million earned over, say, like, it's been released for two and a half years or something like that. So gotcha. I'm just trying to do the sums as to how much we've made roughly on that on that individual song that's that's the only way i can figure it out um but yeah you're talking about that you're talking about thousands um thousands not millions obviously like on that i don't know what the click rate uh, the easiest way to do it man is just to look up online what the click rate or so what the mm. what the amount received per view is i think but i th but but the apparent so th something to note is that the views and the money you earn from the views can fluctuate based on time of season or like time of the year. So apparently um, there are different parts, different times in the year where the ad rates are reduced and the money you make is, is significantly lower because for example, um, in, I think it might be January, February time, the, uh, the ad rates are lower because people aren't selling as many products at that point. Perhaps in the lead up to Christmas or like in summer, the advertisers are just like investing a lot more in those ads, therefore you make more money off the clip. So, that, so I think it's affected uh, by seasonality, I think, you know. Uh, but yeah, again, sorry, I can't provide, provide a figure. Um, so is, that and th is that where a lot of the revenue comes from, is the advertising that's played on these... Pure, yeah, it's solely from that. So with YouTube, you um, you are you are essentially a, a partner, I guess. With so the platform uh, is the platform receive money from advertisers that get to have their pop up ad at the beginning of your clip. They make you a partner that receives a percentage of the money they get, um, and that's how it works. So um, yeah. Do you Make think sure. anybody's going to pay for YouTube um, premium? Um, yeah, I don't the know. Only, the I... only reason why I ask that is, you know, I've, I've been seeing on the Reddit forums and what, and just people saying we're not going to pay for it. And, and also mm. people starting to get annoyed at these 30 second to one minute ads behind be, be, yeah. you know, of things. Um, do you think yeah. that's something that YouTube has got to do to stay afloat or is like, do you think that's going to change? What's your thoughts on it? I feel uh, as a slightly cynical guy, um, like I've watched clips, like um, you can watch clips on YouTube of, of the YouTubers or users. They like to get quite frustrated with the scenario and feel that they can exercise some degree of power over a massive platform like YouTube. But in reality, we don't have any power. And I think like, it's the same with the Facebook um, ads, you know, when, so originally when you used to post something on Facebook as a page, so if you've got your, uh, you know, successful page with its 50,000 likes or whatever, you used to go bang, I've uh, got a new single coming out tomorrow, come and buy it or whatever. Um, but they, and you get 50,000 50, of your fans would all see that post essentially. Exactly. So they realized that they could monopolize that. And, um, Everyone was 
in uproar. Yeah, because you you suddenly they didn't really tell you, but one day you do that post and like, oh, get ready, guys, here comes a single. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, cool, I didn't. Two Anyone? likes. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Two likes and a uh, and a comment from your mum on there. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you're just like what the what the fuck um so yeah people were you know out, outraged by this but what can you do like what what are you gonna what are you gonna do there's no no petition in the world that's gonna stop them exercising basic capitalism and i think like um yeah same with youtube they can really do what they want and um yeah it's amazing it's been free for so long Exactly. I, I see. I, 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 uh, even though I'm a total cynic with that kind of stuff, I see everything as a bit of a bonus, really. Like, mm. that didn't really exist before. They are providing a service, therefore they kind of have the right to do whatever they want. Um, but yeah, it kind of sucks. It sucks that you get used to it one way and then they, they, uh, they call change it, it. Call on the market and change it. You know? So I'm just looking over what is... Uh, what is the, no, actually so a couple, a couple of questions, actually. One of them is what, uh, what rookie mistakes did you make that would, you would advise your 20 year old self not to make again? Oh man. Yeah. All right. Yes. I think, um, I think I've probably mentioned it already. The biggest mistake I ever made was not taking a long look in the mirror at the beginning of my musical quest or whatever it was to, to as soon as I got a shot in the music industry in London, uh, I hadn't really taken the time to figure out what I can and can't do well, I think. So pretty obvious advice, but just like play to your strengths, realize what it is you're good at and what you're not good at. For me, I just, thought I was a jack of all trades and I could just go out there and do everything that everyone else is doing. Um, and I was, and I, I wouldn't accept, I think, part, you know, partly because you, if you, if you're trying to be good at music, like you get this kind of, um, I don't know, you've got such a will to succeed in every area that you pursue, you assume that you're going to every time. And I yeah. think like for me, I thought I could be the ultimate, you know, live, I'd be bloody like Ziggy Stardust up there. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, and, uh, and uh, I wouldn't accept that that wasn't the case for years. Uh, and it took me, and, 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 and the moment I accepted it, the funny thing is, and this is like way into the process, things started going a lot better for me, I think, mm -hmm. because, um, yeah, just don't, ultimate advice for my 20 year old self, don't be an idiot, mate. Like just honestly, but it, you, it, 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 like you said, it is it is good. At, I mean, yeah, pl like know your strengths and know your weaknesses, and and you know we've heard we've heard that before. But I mean, I guess how you know how would have you what would you say to yourself to to try and figure out like what are your strengths? Would it would it say like you know just check you know check your ego and realize that you're know, you're young and you think you can do everything, but you can't. How like yeah? You know, how would you kind of go through that process again to figure out your strengths? Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, that's the thing. It, it probably was quite glaring to to most people. I think it's it's hard. It depends on what type of person you are, what kind of temperament you've got. I think um, some people, some people maybe a bit luckier. They have like a decent dialogue going with a number of people around them that can say, "Look, mm. listen to me." Um, I think this this part, and actually, I remember there was a guy uh, that I worked with quite early in the in the music business in London, who took me to one side quite early, and he addressed those issues with me. Um, but I was such a such a hard headed dick at the time. I just said, "Yeah, what do you know, mate? You, with your forty five years experience." Yeah. <laughs> and, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess like the, uh, yeah, there's so usually find, find people's opinions you can trust. And with experience, yeah. and then when they and then listen to what they say, I guess. Is, yeah. yeah, exactly. You must have had you must have had a few moments like that, right? Where you just someone's someone's given you some advice, and you've uh, yeah, you either heeded it or not, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you get advice, go and write it down, 
and then like read it every week or so and just keep like meditate on it. Like you said, like look in the mirror and just think about what they're saying and don't instantly dismiss it. Um, and I think like in your case, especially if someone pulls you aside, you know, it's, I, I know I've pulled people aside as well and you've really, it's not something you take lightly, you know, you really, cause you realize you can hurt someone's feelings and, and it's can be quite sensitive. So you know, if somebody is doing that to you, do realize that they're not just doing it because they've got some ego trip. They probably genuinely yeah. have a good insight. Another one is like, I think, I think it's important to have some kind of plan B uh, with your music career. Like, I think that's probably another factor that, that, that led me to perhaps make a few mistakes is that I put all my eggs in one basket with it to some extent. And I thought, well, if this doesn't work, then God knows what I'm going to do. Um, I mean, thankfully it's sort of all right at the moment, but like, mm. but for the years when you, when you're, when things aren't going your way and you're, you're pushing and pushing and it's getting quite stressful to try and maintain it. Um, yeah. If you, if you've told yourself from the outset that there's no alternative version of your life, then of course it's going to be, it's going to be, there's going to be so much added pressure to make it work. And I think that pressure for me, um, you know, had, had, had an impact on my ability to, to perform or deliver the way I should have, you know? Mm. Um, so, no, yeah. I, 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 I believe that there is a stigmatism in the, in the music industry where if you have a alternative income stream that whatever you're, working in a restaurant or a shop or, you know, you do graphic and design on the side as a freelancer, somehow that if you're not making all your money as a career musician, you're not a real musician or you're, or you're not a success. Um, mm. Whereas, uh, yeah, like, I, but I always believe you should have like a, um, a, a plan B going along. And also because ultimately the, you know, the world, you can't have everybody a superstar. Like you the society doesn't function that way. People need to, you know, people, then all the other mechanics of the world that needs to keep moving along. Um, <laughs> and if we all wanted to play music, like, you know, if there's a large part of humanity that want to play music, yeah, we can't. Yeah. And, if, and if the mechanics want to play music as well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Rob, the, I mean, we didn't talk too much about your album, but what's the, what's the future going to bring? I know you said it's maybe a bit more of a hobby. Now, mm. are you going to keep writing? Are you still writing stuff at the moment? What, what's on the horizon? Well, mate, thanks for asking. Um, I, <laughs> I have, I love making, as much as I, I don't make money, I, I probably, I'm unlikely to, unless something weird happens. Um, I don't really make money from that, but what I have realized is, Making music all the time, as in doing it for a living and then doing it as a hobby, doesn't really work that well because it's bloody training, like the whole process. So what I've done is, because I make music on a digital, in a digital uh, way, I guess, like using the usual DAWs and interfaces, yeah. you know, synths and what, whatever. What, uh, what uh, door do you use? <laughs> glad you asked um i use logic pro one of the early versions of logic i think <laughs> i just haven't updated it um nice. but yeah so what i realized is doing that full time as a job and all the editing and crap that comes with it to make uh you know bespoke production commercial material for people is a lot of work and then when i kind of go to do my uh indulgent hobby music my my um my songwriting uh and record that and i find myself doing it all over again in my spare time and it's something i realize i don't want to do so i've taken my personal music into completely into the analog realm so i've invested in a uh, reel-to-reel tape machine and um how's that working out <laughs> <laughs> that is a, there is a Sorry, we, story we wait have, wait wait <laughs> I do know that Rob has had some issues with getting reel to reels <laughs> delivered to Melbourne. That hasn't been as easy as what he <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we strangely enough, uh, and the reason I didn't recoil in horror after you said that uh, is that apparently this this reel to reel might be making it to me after all. Oh wow! So we'll see. But yeah, so there's going to be a reel to reel. It's all analog. It's it, basically I don't want to be looking at a screen when I'm doing yep. my. I think that's what it comes down to. You know. 
You want a new environment, you know. I want a very tactile situation where I can, you know, mm. turn up the gain on something and the weather, get the compression, the compression right on my outboard gear, <laughs> all that <laughs> stuff, without just dicking around with plugins all my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's not answered the question. What's going on with that? I don't know. I love writing music, and I will continue to yeah. do that. So, so hopefully, life. though, your perhaps your next album will be all analog and reel to reel potentially. Mm. It will be, yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your time, Rob. Uh, that was really insightful, uh, particularly, Thanks. especially with all the YouTube stuff. That was amazing. Mm, I hope it's, yeah, I hope it's of use to someone. Um, mate, it's been great chatting. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob.